Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 this morning. So this morning, we look here in chapter 2 at, at, at just a powerful example of what the Lord has done in saving each and every one of us. How has he saved you? What did he save you from? And why did he save you? The answers to that, those questions, are right here in this particular text. Go back with me in chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. There Paul is praying for a spiritual revelation that the Ephesians might have their eyes opened to see the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Now, if you go to chapter 2, verse 1, notice it says, and you were made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, obviously, if you take the chapter heading out, you can see that this is a continuation. He's saying, look, look at the power of God in raising Jesus from the dead. But here's a more, a very interesting example, another example of his power. He raised you from the dead as well. He changed you from being dead and made you alive. So do you see the point that he's making? Because to start verse 1 of chapter 2 with, and you, really doesn't make any sense unless you read the verses before it. So let's read verse verse 1 of chapter 2. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others." But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So what Paul does here is he explains this incredible example, this awesome example of your salvation. Now think about this. This is the example he wants you to think about concerning the power of God. The power of God to transform your life. And every single one of us in this room, if you're a Christian here today, you understand what that means. You have a personal testimony in your own, of your own life of how he saved you. How he took you from being dead and he made you alive. And so this is the, the personal example that he wants to leave with these believers as he writes this letter to them. He wants them to see the exceeding greatness of his power that would raise Christ from the dead, but that would also raise you from the dead. And so every one of us has a personal insight into what he's talking about. So what was life like for you before you were saved? Well, very simply, you were dead. That's his point here. You were dead to God, dead to his life, dead to his truth, dead to the purpose that he had created you for. You were dead in trespasses and sins. So sin is what kills us, makes us dead to God. Sin, 
That is the key. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, God warned Adam and Eve. He said, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And that's exactly what happened. The moment that they ate of that fruit, they were what? They were banished from the garden and separated from God and from the life of God. So that's what sin does. In Romans 6.23, it says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So in the Old Testament and the New Testament, you see the same message. Sin brings death. Now, did Adam and Eve immediately physically die? No, they did not. So what is God talking about here? Well, he's talking about them dying spiritually. Because the Bible says that we are body, soul, and spirit. Your body is alive right now. Every person that is on this planet, their body is alive. They have a soul. Every human being has a soul. That soul is your mind, your emotions, your will. But this third aspect of the spirit of man, uh, every man, every woman is dead in trespasses and sins. So spiritually, a person is dead until the moment they receive Christ. And when they do, they come alive. And all of a sudden, they experience a life that they have never experienced before. It's really hard to kind of put your finger on and really think back to realize what it was like. But that is a reality. Keith Green said in a song, he said, it's like waking up from a dream. And I like that because that describes what salvation is like. It's like you're, you're just comatose. And you wake up from a dream that's a bad dream. And you realize you're alive. Real life has come into your soul. And so that is what is the problem with mankind. Man is dead. Don't look for some deep, dark, secret thing that makes man and makes the world the way it is. It's very simple. It's just one issue. Man is dead toward God and dead toward his truth and to his law. And so men make their own law. They're a law unto themselves and they choose to do whatever they please. And when they do that, they experience more and more of the consequence of sin, which is death. And so People try and medicate themselves. They try and find something else to give them some life. And they think, oh, if I just do this, this will make me happy. That will make me happy. And they keep looking in vain because nothing makes them happy. And so then someone comes and shares the the message of the gospel. And a person either accepts or rejects that message. If you accept it, you believe in him, you will be transformed. You will be changed in a moment. And at that moment, you will know what real life is like. Now, what does this word here, dead, mean? Does that mean that you are completely unable to do anything until what? Until the Lord does something in your life? I bring this question up because extreme Calvinists say that people who are non-Christians, people in this world who do not believe, they are unable to believe, to repent, or to make a choice to respond unless God first makes them alive. So what does the Bible teach? Do you have to be made alive, born again, before you get born again? Because that's what they're teaching. Or can you receive 
and repent and make a choice that then makes you alive. I believe it's the latter. You see, the Bible is very clear about what the word dead means. It means that you're separated from God. That's what sin does. It separates a person from God. That's what happened to Adam and Eve in the garden. They were immediately separated from God because they made a choice. And so it says in Isaiah 59, verse 2, notice, here's the definition of what it means to be dead toward God. But your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Now, I like that little phrase there, your sins have hidden his face from you. Because that's exactly what happened to Adam and Eve, correct? His face was hidden from them. And they were separated from him. That's what death means. A person is separated from God, and that's all that it means. Because Jesus commanded dead people to repent and believe and choose. Where do I find that in the scripture? It's everywhere. Here's just two verses. Mark 1.15. Jesus here is commanding dead people to repent and to believe. He says the time is fulfilled. And by the way, this is the first message that Jesus preaches. Okay? So he's saying the time is fulfilled the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So he's telling people who are unbelievers to repent and to believe. Jesus tells the same thing in Revelation 3.20. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Here Jesus pleads with dead people to respond to him and open the door of their heart, which means dead people can make that choice to do that. Now, the interesting thing about this verse in Revelation 3.20 is that he's talking to the Laodicean church. So he's talking about to people who are in a church who are still dead. Now, that's really scary. Think about that for a minute. There are people in churches across our land every day, every Sunday that come to church and they're dead. They are not believers. And the question I have for you is, are you dead or are you alive? Are you a believer? Are you absolutely sure that you're a believer and that you're alive from the dead? Because if I don't ask you that question and pose that challenge to your heart, I would not be a minister of Jesus Christ. So I encourage you, think on this. It's an incredibly important issue for you to think about. So, secondly here, notice what else he says. Not only are you de- were you dead and made alive, but he said in verse 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. So what does it mean to walk according to the course of this world? Well, the word course is a Greek word that means age. So it's really important that you see what is the age of this world or the values of this world. Because the values of this world are those which influence you. So you used to be dominated by the thoughts, the opinions, and the goals of this world. What are the goals of this world? What are the values of this world? The values of this world are money, pleasure, power, beauty, intellect. That is what this world pursues. And This is what you have to be careful of. Because every single day, you are bombarded with those values and those morals 
that come your way. I want to challenge you. The next time you turn on your television, we usually mute the commercials when they come, right? Well, leave it on and listen to them and sit there and look at every single one of those commercials and make a determination, what are they trying to attract me to? What are they trying to tell me I need? You see, that's, this is the pressure. This is the, the morals and the values of this world. And so you may watch a, a car commercial and it's maybe the fastest thing on the road. Well, they're, they're appealing to your desire for power and speed. Or maybe it's, it's the classy look. So you want to look classy driving this. Or what, whatever the commercial is, it is dealing with some particular value of this world. Now, you know, a, a, a small percentage of them are dealing with uh, something that's altruistic, you know, helping some organization or, or hospital or something like that. Those are great. But trying to pursue your desires and the values that you possess, they are trying to reach them. And yet the scripture tells me not to be conformed to this age and to this world. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So don't be conformed to this world. That's what you used to do if you still allow yourselves to be pressured to conform to this world, it will stumble you. And so you have to be very careful. And then thirdly, you once conducted yourselves by living after the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Verse 3, we were all once conducted ourselves in, in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. So basically what he's saying there is you were living on those first two planes, the physical and the soulish plane, not the spiritual. So he said, this is the way you lived and you were drawn by your desires, your feelings. And so many times commercials are pointed and directed at your feeling, your feeling about yourself and about how you perceive yourself and what you think will make you a, a, a more cool person or more intellectually, you know, up there with everybody else type of person. And this is what the world does. But it, they deal with the soulish issues and physical issues, the desires that you have within you. Now, the Bible says that we have an old nature and we have a new nature. And these two natures today are at war with each, each other, inside of us. And so the desires, or literally the scripture calls them the lusts of the flesh versus the lusts or the desires of the spirit, these two are contrary so that you don't always do what you would. So this is the reason why we fail. This is the reason why we fall. Because we allow the desires of our sinful nature to control us versus allowing the desires of our spiritual nature to control us. So it's, you again, you have the choice. Which will control you? Do you know that the Bible describes the non-Christian or the life before you were a believer like you're a donkey in heat? Now think about this. Let me, let me read to you this passage of Scripture. 
It's in Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. And the people don't believe that they are sinful. They don't believe they've done anything wrong. And so Jeremiah says to them, How can you say, I am not polluted? I have not gone after the Baals. Because the worship of Baal was on every high mountain in Israel. And he's saying, how can you say this? I mean, you're, that you're not polluted. You haven't gone after the Baals. He says, see your way in the valley. Know what you have done. You are a swift dromedary, which is a, a one hump camel. He says, breaking loose in her ways. So he uses this camel, a camel as an example, because camels are very unruly. Okay? I, I've, I've seen them in Israel many times, and they are unruly beasts. I'm telling you. And they spit as well. So you don't want to get in front of them because they're, they're just not real nice creatures. And so he uses them, you know, uses this word picture here to describe man's nature. That it's unruly. It's, it, as he describes here, he says, breaking loose in her ways. Then verse 24. He says, a wild donkey used to the wilderness that sniffs at the wind in her desire in, the, in her time of mating. Who can turn her away. Interesting. Who can turn her away? So he's literally saying, this is the way we lived. We were like wild donkeys in heat. And when we want something, we're going to get it, no matter what it takes. That's the way we lived. And so if your feelings and desires motivated you then, what has to take place today. You cannot be guided by your desires and your feelings today. You have to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. He has to rule over you and controlling those desires. Because if you don't, then you will never mature as a believer in Christ. So very important. Then fourth, he says, you once walked according to the prince of the power of the air. Verse 2, the spirit that now works, and that word works is in the present tense, that continually works in the sons of disobedience. Now first, what does this mean, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience? Does this mean that every non-Christian has Satan living inside them? No, it does not. It does not mean that. Now, I say that because there are Christian groups that believe that you, that is the case, and they believe that Christians can be demon-possessed as well. And neither is a correct truth. It's not, neither is taught in the Scripture. So what does it mean? Well, the Dictionary of Biblical Languages defines the word spirit here as the attitude, disposition, or influence of a person, depending on the context. So if you see this, this term in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, it says this, If a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. So what's he saying? He's saying in an attitude or disposition of gentleness. You need to have that attitude when you're restoring someone. Why? He says, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So you need to have gentleness and love for people who are struggling. Because one day, you're going to be struggling. And you're going to Hope and pray that someone will be gentle and loving towards you. And so the idea here is that the influences, the disposition, the ideas of the enemy itself and all of his demonic minions and associates, that they are all influencing 
men in this world. And they do it on a regular basis. And people in this world don't even realize that it's happening. Did you? Did you realize that it was happening to you when you were a non-Christian? No. But the Bible says in 1 John 5, 19, it declares there, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And so the enemy of our souls, the enemy of all men, is literally holding the rest of the world under his sway. And so this is the plight of mankind today. The devil manipulates all men through the world and through their desires, through his lies, and through their blindness. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, there Paul says concerning men's minds that the God of this age has blinded who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God should shine on them. And so he is blinding the minds of those that do not believe in him. And so you have the authority over him to set them free from that. You by the power of the Holy Spirit and through prayer can bind the powers of darkness that blind the eyes of those who believe not. So if you want to pray something very effective for your unsaved family members or friends, you pray for them that the Lord would just open their eyes, that he would bind the powers of darkness that blind them so that they may see. Now, does that guarantee that they will be saved? No, it does not. Why? Because they have a choice. They have a decision to make. When you're praying for someone else, you have to realize they have a will, just like you have a will. And so they have to make that decision as well. But I guarantee you, God is going to open their eyes and he's going to speak to them. I've had non-Christians tell me this, that, that they would get these glimpses of the truth, but then they go, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to do that because that means I have to give up this and I don't want to give up that. And so it is a, an essential aspect to your prayer life. Now, fifth and last, he also, Paul says here, you were once by nature a child of wrath. Notice there at the end of verse 3. And we're by nature children of wrath just as the others. So what does this mean? Well, man by his nature is in rebellion against God. Because he's under the sway of the wicked one. And the wicked one is in rebellion against God. So under his sway, they are also in rebellion against God. And so that rebellion is a man is right within a person's nature. So the old nature of the sinful nature of man is naturally rebellious. So when you are not walking in the spirit, what happens to you? Why is it that you feel rebellious at times? And you say, I don't want to do that. You're not going to make me do it, God, because I'm not going to do it. Have you ever been in that spot? Well, that's, that's just who you are. That's the person you are. And without the Holy Spirit ruling in your life, that's what you would do. So you need to walk in the Spirit because that is your only option for freedom from that rebellious nature that is within you. So, you never have to teach a child to sin, do you? You never have to teach them to deceive. You never have to teach them to, to lie. They just do it by nature. And I guarantee you, that is the proof of the sinful nature of man. 
And so this issue is essential. The word nature, is to, to define that word, is very important. It means the innate characteristics within man. The nature of man. So God has given us his nature, which gives us these innate characteristics of love and joy and peace and giving and service and sacrifice and all of the things that we want to, and we want to live by. But my old nature has innate characteristics that are just the opposite of that. I am selfish. I am self-centered. I'm looking out for me and me alone. And that's all that counts. And so God has basically pronounced sentence upon all men and they are condemned. Because of their rebellion. They're condemned already, even at this moment. Even though they have not died. But one day, that will be, they will seal their own fate. In John 3, 18 and 36, Jesus said this. He said, he who believes in him is not condemned. What a, what a glorious truth is that. Just to believe in him, I will not be condemned. I am forgiven. Notice the word but. A divine contrast here. But he who does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So, now this is, this is Jesus talking here. So, he knows what he's talking about. Verse 36 of John 3. He says there, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. So the consequence of sin will always be the wrath of God. And those consequences begin with today when a person sins. Do you realize that? There is a consequence and that's the beginning of his judgment, is the consequence of sin. And then, when I die as an unbeliever, I will experience the full consequences of sin, which is wrath. Now, we've talked about all of the stuff that you don't want to talk about. And now let's talk about the good stuff. Verse 4. But God... Look at those two little words. But God. Here's again Paul's divine contrast. Now those two little words make the difference in your life. You see, because if it wasn't for God, you would be lost. Because there would be no salvation. Christ would have never come. You would have no opportunity of reconciliation with God. So, it really is, is a very powerful statement that Paul is making here. Those two little words have made in your life a dramatic and incredible change. Without his intervention, you and I are lost. That's it. Without him, I'm lost. You know, in Luke 19.10, Jesus said this, he said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. <clears throat> lost. So, this is why he came. This is why he sent people to you to share the gospel with you. This is why you need to share the gospel with others. Is because they need to hear they're lost. And apart from someone sharing the truth of God with them, they will be lost. It's a powerful truth. But notice he says here, but God, who is rich in mercy. Now the word is there is in the present tense. He is continually rich in mercy. He is so rich in mercy. In fact, it's beyond your ability to comprehend how rich he is in mercy. And I will prove that to you in just a moment as we look at this particular.
particular passage. In fact, everything that is stated from verse 4 through 7 is beyond your comprehension to really fathom it because it's so great. It's so good. It's so gracious. It's just, it's beyond your ability to comprehend it. So notice he says here, but God who is rich in mercy. The capacity of his mercy is so great. That's what it declares here. It's so great. His greatness, his great mercy, his great love. It's the capacity of greatness is beyond your ability to really grasp it. In Psalm 103, verse 11, he declares, As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. So great is his mercy. So how great is that? Well, how high are the heavens above the earth? Well, scientists have determined that, you know, the heavens are about 25 billion light years in diameter. So how far is that? It's beyond my ability to comprehend it. I think it's beyond yours as well. But just to help you come to that conclusion, how fast is the speed of light? 25 billion light years. Well, a light year is a long time. How about a light second? One second, the speed of light, 186,000 miles per Per second. You can travel around the earth seven and a half times in one second. That's a long way in one second. And then add 60 seconds to that. That's an enormous amount of distance. And then add not only 60 seconds, but 24 hours to that. It's just an enormous amount. You add seconds to hours to days and then 365 days, that's one light year. 25 billion light years is just beyond. That's how much mercy, the capacity of his mercy is. So when somebody says to me, Steve, I don't know whether God could ever forgive me for this or that. I kind of chuckle to myself and I think, you know what? You have no concept of how great his mercy is. And so I usually take them to this verse of scripture because it's so powerful. The capacity of his mercy is so great. It's beyond what you can fathom in your mind. And then the power of his mercy to remove Notice in Psalm 103, verse 12, very next verse. He says there, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's a long way. So far. Now, if he would have said here, he can remove your transgressions as far as the north is from the south. Well, that would have an end. Do you realize that? Because, you know, when you... Go north, you come to the North Pole, and then you come over the North Pole and you start going south. And you come to the South Pole and then you start going north. So there's a limit there. But if you start going east, you can go east forever and ever. And you will never go west. So he uses this word picture to just blow your mind. That's what he does. And that's what it should do. It should make you think, it's beyond my ability to really grasp this. And it is. And then, the duration of his mercy. His duration, the duration of his mercy is also described here in Psalm 103, verse 17. It says, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. So the duration of his mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. What does that mean? 
Well, the word everlasting means beyond the vanishing point. So as far back as you can think in the past until you can't think anymore, you can't register in, in a historical point of fact, that's everlasting. It's out there someplace. And if you think forward as far as you can think, as far as you can imagine, well, you know, the, the tribulation period, the millennial period, the new heaven and the new earth, and then what's up beyond that? I don't know. That's the vanishing point. So he's saying, that's the duration of God's mercy. So, but notice he says there, there's one qualifier. It says, on those who fear him. And I always point this out to people because sometimes people, they think in their sinful way, as I'll bet you, you've thought about this as well. Well, if God has so much mercy, why don't I just do whatever I please? And, you know, he's got enough mercy to handle it. I can just live as I, I can just sin, 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 and just do whatever I want and just ask for forgiveness. And he's cool with that, right? No, he's not. It says only on those who fear him. You see, I have to have a respect, a reverence towards him. And that is, he, he's not going to play that game. He knows if somebody's playing that game. And he doesn't play that game. He is going to be straight up with anybody that is going to be reverent and respectful toward him. Very important. And so why has God shown us all this mercy? You know, many times people ask those questions, you know, why questions? Why does God do this? Why does God do that? And there's a, a little word that you should always take note of in your, your Bible, and it's the word because. The word because tells you the reason why he does what he does. And we have one of those right here in this verse. Notice what he declares here. In verse 4, he is who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. You see, it's because of his love. Why does God have so much mercy? It's because he just loves you. Now, can you fathom that? No, I can't either. I can't understand why he would love me that much because I know me. You know you. And there is no reason for him to love me. But he does. That's incredible. Paul says the same thing in Titus 3, verses 3 through 5. He says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But... There's that divine contrast again. When the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Notice Paul includes himself in this. He saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. He saves you and he washes you and he regenerates you and renews you, and makes you a new man or woman. Powerful. Now, notice, it's not because I'm such a nice guy that God forgives me. It's because of His great love. It's not because of me, it's because of Him. The reason is in Him. It's not in you. Don't ever try and find a reason in you because it isn't there. It'll never be there. There is no reason to save you. The reason is in Him. And that's the fact. The temporal purpose of His mercy and the eternal purpose of His mercy. Now these two are coupled together here in our text. The temporal or earthly reason for His mercy Notice he says here in verse 5, 
even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And then verse 6, and raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. So here you have the temporal purpose of his mercy, which is what? It is simply to make us alive. That's why. That's the temporal reason. He wants to make you alive from the dead. He wants you to experience what real life is all about. The reason why he saved you is to give you life. And that more abundantly. That's why Jesus came. And Jesus made that so clear over and over again in his ministry. And so he not only saves you to, from hell, he saves you to give you life, but he saves you also to sit you, seat you in heavenly places in Christ. Now, that is the eternal purpose. It's a temporal and eternal purpose. Temporal because that's where your position is today, is seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's what the scripture declares here. And yet, that hasn't taken place until you go to be with him. And when you do, you will take your position with him. In Revelation 3.21, it says, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now those words are again beyond your ability to comprehend them. Sit with him on his throne? Why would he say that? I don't know. But it is the reality. It's what's going to take place. So, People say to me when I read this passage to them, they, they usually say, well, Steve, that is so spiritual, I can't figure out what, in the perp- what would be the purpose for that. Seated with him in heavenly places? I don't get it. Well, here's the way to understand it. What do you do? What are you saying to someone when you say, hey, would you come and sit with me and break bread with me and sit down with me? I'd like to do what? Why do you do that? It's because you accept them. You are friends with them. You don't do that with enemies, right? You do that with friends. You do it so you can have fellowship with them together. You're granting access to you. I mean, those are all the reasons why we sit together with one another. And that is the same reason why we, what Paul is trying to communicate to us here in this text. He's saying, this is what God has granted you. He's granted you acceptance. He's granted you forgiveness. He's granted you fellowship with him. He's granted you access to his power, to his promises. That's what he's granted to you right now. And one day, you will actually experience it. Now, that's why I titled this study, There is No God Like Ours. There's no God like ours. There's no one in this universe like him. It says in Isaiah 46, verse 9, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, a second time he says it, and there is none like me. There is no one like him. He doesn't want to just give you something today. He wants to give you something for eternity. And that he's got a long-term plan to save you and to bless you. Notice verse 7. We'll end with this that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's his eternal plan, to just show you his love for all eternity. That's 
That is grace and mercy that is beyond my ability to really comprehend. How about you? Amen. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you so much today that you have revealed to us, Lord, and reminded us of what we used to be, what life used to be like. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit today would bring that revelation and reminder to each of us, Lord. But also, Lord, I pray that you would reveal to us what we have in Christ today. Your incredible mercy. That mercy that is just beyond our ability to truly fathom it. I pray that you would just break that truth upon our hearts, especially those that are condemning themselves here today. Lord, I pray that you would just break that fresh mercy upon them. You said your mercies are new every morning. Break that mercy upon those condemned hearts today. And Lord, I pray that you would just bring that that freshness, that life, that joy into each one of our hearts here today as we wait upon you, as we worship you, as we give you praise. Lord, you're an awesome God and there is no one like you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.